Chapter 9, Cell Division and Reproduction. <clears throat> so why do cells divide? Cell division ensures the passage of genetic information. And this type of cell division, we're going to look at mitotic cell division in this chapter. This takes place uh, immediately when the sperm and the egg meet. We have mitotic cell division occurring. So it's the formation of body cells. So cell division is involved in both asexual and sexual reproduction. Somatic cells are body cells that make up most of the organism. Somatic cells would be like your skin cells, uh, uh, cardiac cells, muscle cells, all those cells. Those are body cells, typical body cells, and those are what compose us as an organism. <clears throat> now, we know that all living things reproduce, whether it be sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, we're going to talk about a special type of cell division that is involved there. But in asexual reproduction, you increase in number of somatic cells or the number of unicellular organisms. So we'll look at a special type of asexual reproduction in this chapter. If you're not a somatic cell, you are a germ cell. And germ cells are found only in the testes and ovaries, and they produce sperm and egg. And the production of sperm and egg is the second type of cell division that we'll visit in the next chapter. The sperm and egg, also known as gametes, are, are uh, involved in a process called sexual reproduction, and it requires the production of sperm and egg uh, in order for sexual reproduction to occur. So you have the exchange of sperm and egg. Prokaryotes reproduce asexually. So we know that in bacteria and archaeans, these are essentially two types of bacteria, the bacteria, the true bacteria, and the archaean, archaic bacteria, uh, reproduction consists of duplicating the single chromosome found in the nucleoid region and distributing a copy to each daughter cell. <clears throat> if we look at the mechanism for uh, what prokaryotes call asexual reproduction or binary fission, basically what you have is the attachment of the chromosome to the plasma membrane in the nucleoid region, and that circular chromosome is going to be replicated. And in replication, that means the chromosome is going to be copied, so you have double that chromosome number. DNA replication has produced two identical chromosomes, and now, after that chromosome has been replicated, the cell wall and the plasma membrane begin to grow inward. So you get this elongation of the cell, and eventually it starts to elongate enough that the cytoplasm starts to pinch inward. This would be the presence of a, of a cleavage. So eventually, uh, once you start to see that pinching inward of the cytoplasm, you now have cytokinesis occurring. And the cytoplasm will eventually pinch off enough that at the end of binary fission, the new cell will have a new cell wall, a new plasma membrane, and you'll have each cell containing a copy of that circular chromosome. So this is binary fission where you produce two new daughter cells from one original parent cell. Now, if you look, here are examples uh, of what that would look like in Escherichia coli. So here you have that original cell at 200 nanometers. Here you could start to see the pinching inward of the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm division would be called cytokinesis. And then down here you see that even is more evident. And eventually that cleavage will, will pinch in enough that you'll have those two new uh, daughter E. coli cells that have stemmed from that one parental cell. In, in optimal conditions, optimal temperature and, and heating and humidity and, and nutrient availability, uh, in the optimal conditions, Estrichia coli can reproduce uh, uh, by double time every 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes, one cell will become two, two, four. So it's an exponential growth rate. Somatic cells have the cell cycle and undergo mitosis and cytokinesis. So as a eukaryotic organism, how do we generate new cells? We go through this stage. In the eukaryotic cell cycle, there is a series of events. And most of our cells, uh, the large majority of our cells, spend a lot of their time in a phase called interphase, the time when the cell performs its usual functions. And interphase is composed, if you look at the diagram here, of three stages. You have G1, which is a period of growth for the cell. You have the S phase of interphase, which is growth, and that's where our DNA replication would, would occur. And then you have the G2 phase, which is growth and final preparation for division. 
and then you have the M phase, and in the M phase, you have the mitotic cell division and cytokinesis occurring. In mitotic stage, the M mitotic stage of cell division, the cell division occurs during the M stage and encompasses both division of the nucleus and division of the cytoplasm. Back in elementary school, your teacher probably learned about, you taught you cell division was mitosis. Well, mitosis is a special type of cell division, but mitosis in general is a stage of cell division in which the nuclear region is going to divide. The rest of the cell needs to divide as well. That's where cytokinesis comes into play, because that is where you have division of the cytoplasm. And here you could see uh, two noticeable eukaryotic cells. The uh, other cells that are stained around it in orange would be representation of bacterial cells. So here you can see cytokinesis, and this would be an animal cell having the presence of that cleavage furrow there. So eukaryotic chromosomes are visible during cell division. So when a eukaryotic cell is not undergoing division, the DNA within the chromosome is in a mass of thin threads called chromatin. And when we're talking about cell structure and function, I told you to, to, to envision the nucleus, you have the nuclear envelope, and then you have the nucleolus inside, and then you have the DNA surrounding. Well, the DNA in the form of an, uh, is in its form of chromatin when that cell is not dividing. And a good uh, kind of analogy to kind of describe what this would look like would be spaghetti noodles in a bowl, and that nucleolus being that meatball in the center. And then, of course, the sauce would be the nucleoplasm. So before the nuclear division, chromatin will condense. And as the chromatin condenses, you form two identical chromatids. And these are what we would call sister chromatids. So if you look here, here you have a condensed duplicated chromosome. And those chromosomes are two sister chromatids. And the center of attachment, which is right here in this part, called this is the center, that would be the centromere. So where two sister chromatids attach, that's called the centromere. So here you have one chromatid right here. Here's the centromere where they attach. Here's the second chromatid. So these are sister chromatids. Somatic cells are diploid, which is abbreviated 2N. So in diploid cells, it includes two chromosomes of each kind. During mitosis, a diploid nucleus, or 2N nucleus, divides to produce daughter nuclei that are also diploid, or 2N. A dividing cell is called the parent cell, and the new cells are called daughter cells. Our gametes, which are our sperm and egg, our gametes are haploid, that's N. So the number of chromosomes contains only one copy, one chromosome of each kind. It's half the diploid number. So if you look here, here you have sister chromatids, and here's their centromere where they attach. This would be a duplicated chromosome. So each one of these is, is a chromosome or a chromatid. So when sister chromatids separate, each nucleus gets a chromosome. Our somatic cells are diploid. For humans, that means we have 46 chromosomes. That's our diploid number. Our sperm and egg are haploid in chromosome numbers. So they have half of that. So our sperm, male sperm, carries 23 chromosomes. The female ovum carries 23 chromosomes. And then when they unite, that's when you restore that diploid number upon fertilization. So mitosis maintains the chromosome number. Before mitosis, DNA has to replicate. Each double helix is in a chromatid, and the chromosomes consist of sister chromatids attached at a centromere. So the centromere is the microtubule organization, organization or organizing center of the cell uh, divides before mitosis. So where two sister chromatids attach, you have the centromere. In animal cells, you get the spindle formation, and spindle fibers separate the sister chromatids of duplicated chromosomes. Now, the spindle fibers are going to attach to the chromosome at a point called the kinetochore, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the stages of cell division. So if you look, here are the stages of cell division. I encourage you to copy them down in the, uh, from the lecture slides here. You could also look in your book. Uh, this is the same diagram that is illustrated in your book. So we do have that G1, S, and G2 phase. So in interphase, which is what the cell spends the majority of its life in, it's the normal functioning stages of the cell. In the G1 phase, you have uh, growth. In the S phase, you have DNA replication. And in the G2 phase, 
you have a second period of growth, and then the cell preps itself for the division of the nucleus. So this is somatic cells, body cells. So if you're talking about the body tissue of humans, or you could look at the body tissue of plants as well. So what happens? In early prophase, the centrosomes have divided, and the centrosomes in animal cells are regions where centrioles will form, and then you start to form that spindle fiber coming out of the centrioles there. So the chromatin is condensing to form chromosomes, and the nuclear envelope is starting to fragment, so it's starting to break down and dissolve. In prophase, the nucleolus has fully disappeared, and duplicated chromosomes are now visible. Centrosomes begin moving apart, and the spindle is in the process of forming. In early metaphase, each duplicated chromosome is attached to a spindle fiber by a kinetochore. Some spindle fibers stretch from the, the spindle pole, and they begin to overlap. So some of these spindle fibers are going to attach to these, the chromosomes at their kinetochore and move those chromosomes around, and then other spindle fibers are going to push out to the poles of the cell. That's going to help the cell elongate, so it's going to help the cell when cytokinesis needs to begin. A uh, key point about metaphase is that those centromeres of duplicated chromosomes are all aligned at the equator, uh, which is the center of the cell. The kinetochore is attached to sister chromatids to the spindle fibers that come from opposite spindle poles. In anaphase now, those sister chromatids are going to pull apart and become daughter chromosomes that are pulled toward the spindle poles. In this way, each pole receives the same number and kinds of chromosomes as the parent cell. And then lastly, in the last stage of mitosis, you have telophase, and the daughter cells are forming as nuclear envelopes and the nucleoli start to reappear. The chromosomes will become indistinct chromatin again. And it's at the very late stages of telophase when you start to have cytokinesis occurring. In the animal cell, as you can see up here on the upper diagram, cytokinesis is the cleavage furrow. Down here in the plant cell, you get the formation of that cell plate. So cytokinesis divides the cytoplasm, and cytokinesis follows mitosis in most cells. Cytokinesis in plant cells occurs by a process different than in animal cells. In plant cells, you get the formation of the cell plate, and that cell plate is a bunch of vesicles that are coming down into the center of the cell, and they're depositing the new materials that will eventually become the newly formed cell wall and newly formed plasma membrane. In the animal cell, you get that contractile vacuole, contractile ring, I mean, that will start to surround the cell and create that cleavage furrow, and eventually that will keep contracting until the cytoplasm is pinched, and you'll have two distinct cells. And here in plants, you can see that cell plate there. So that's going to form the new cell wall, laying down those cellulose components. Now, not all cells undergo cell division. So I'm going to quick go back to here, this beginning slide. So most of our body cells do undergo this entire process, where they spend a period of their life in interphase, and then when the cell divides to regenerate new cells, we go through that M phase. However, some cells are stuck in this G0 phase. So that means once they reach adulthood, or they are mature, fully matured, they no longer divide. This is typical of nerve cells which is why after a stroke, uh, you cannot regenerate, or if you have uh, nervous tissue damage or nerve damage, you lose the ability to control that part of functioning of the body because nerve cells are not regenerated. They are kind of stuck in this G0 stage. But for the rest of our body cells, such as our skin cells, our skin cells are constantly being replenished. Uh, they will go through that G1, which is a period of growth. Then they'll go through the S phase, which is a period of growth again and DNA replication, and then we go through the G2 phase, which is growth, and the final preparations before mitotic cell division should occur. So we have the stages of nuclear division, which would be the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and then right at the end of telophase, you need to div divide the rest of the cell, which would be cytokinesis. This is all controlled by chemical messaging and stuff within the cell, and we'll talk about that uh, more in-depth in class and with our lab, and then we'll talk about what happens, this is cancer, when things aren't controlled. Have a great day.